What Azula Needs for Redemption Why She Is the Way She Is Azula on the Couch Azula has a lot of issues. Understatement of the decade, sure, but true nonetheless. We learned how this all came to be in the case of conditional love, but we left on a thorny note. Can Azula be redeemed? What would that journey look like for her? What would she need to do? And what would she need in order to do it? And at the end of it all, when her own reserves and motivations fail, who can help her best on the path of change? Because at this point, Azula can't do it by herself, but we'll get there. Let's focus on the things that only Azula can change. Let's start with a few basic things. What Azula needs and why. Everyone into the hole! It's so dark down here. Well, what choice do I have? Trust is for fools. Azula needs to learn how to trust. Azula definitely does not trust other people. She uses wit, fear, and skill to keep a tight leash on those in her circle and those outside of it. She uses people's insecurities and weaknesses without a second thought, anything to keep the control in her own hands. She doesn't show all her cards. She doesn't spare a lot of intimacy. It's almost as if she's too clever for trust, too smart. She thinks not being trusting to be discerning and cynical is more of a power and neutral than to trust those in the world blindly. And sometimes in the show, she even convinces the audience of that. In her situation as a royal princess with enemy nations, it almost makes sense. I'm sure that's what she thought and what she wanted other people to think too, like Zuko. Trust is for fools. Isn't that what she said? Trust is not for fools. Trust is essential for healthy relationships, and the trust you have with others can often be tied to the trust you have towards yourself. If you don't let anyone in because you're afraid of being hurt, do you trust yourself to withstand the fallout of a failed relationship or poor communication? Azula doesn't trust that. She doesn't trust that if she doesn't keep her friends afraid of her, fearing her, that they will desire to stay with her without it. Azula doesn't trust that if she fell below top tier effort, that her father would still value and compliment her alone. She doesn't trust that if she lets Zuko in or close to her, that he would embrace her. She thinks he's waiting for a chance to strike her down and she treats everyone else in the same way. If I get them first, they can't get me. To an extent, it can be a useful tactic, but after a while, I'm sure it became tiring for Azula to be unable to depend on anyone, not even her family. The first time her trust was broken was with her mother. As children, we assume our parents love and adore us. When faced with the exact opposite, when Ursa was put off by her daughter's behavior, Azula didn't know how to think, and it broke her realm of reality as a child, her sense of safety, and her sense of self-worth. She developed the monster narrative and began to live by it. Even at her peak, her unwillingness to trust other people is a remnant of her trying to avoid and run from that old pain of being rejected by her mother. No one can reject her in that way ever again if she doesn't let them in, if she dominates them. But see where that strategy got her? Alone. As she felt from the beginning and as she felt in the end, always alone. To heal, Azula needs to learn how to trust that she alone is enough to maintain relationships and that she is capable of rising again if a failed relationship or communication knocks the wind out of her sails, as her mother did with her so long ago. She can have friends, she can have lovers, she can have old family and new family, but she will need to be able to trust. And for her, this may be one of the hardest things to do. It goes against everything in her that she sharpened in order to survive. But Azula is nothing if not resilient. I love you, Azula. I do. Number two. Azula needs to learn how to love others and herself. Azula may like herself. She may even respect herself, but she doesn't love herself. If she did, she wouldn't do everything in her power to make her father love her, the one person she thinks is capable or willing of giving that to her. 
She wouldn't live by this idea of Ursa thinking she was a monster if she loved herself. She wouldn't use tactics outside of herself to bind people to her and her will, even if that's against their wills. She would know that she was enough. When Zuko learned that he alone was enough without the crown, without the history, without the imperialism, without the prestige, without the wealth, without the looks, without the respect, and without the love, when he learned that he was enough, he was finally free from Ozai's stranglehold, and everyone else's for that matter. Zuko is his own man, an authentic man, because of this hard-learned lesson. But it was my idea to burn everything to the ground! I deserve to be by your side! Number 3. Azula needs to learn that she doesn't need to do anything else to earn love from those that truly matter. She could trust enough to let people love her and let them in, but the question is, Will she? Does she know that she doesn't have to do anything for real love? Does she know that love can exist outside of conditional parameters? I don't think she does, as she's lived her whole life under a man whose love was conditional, and a mother whose love seemed conditional. And so, Azula's going to have to learn that there are other options for her in terms of intimacy, love, and connection outside of meeting people's conditions. She doesn't have to do anything not for the ones that matter. My own mother thought I was a monster. She was right, of course, but it still hurt. Number four, Azula needs to learn how to let go. Of what, you may ask? Well, the first obvious thing would be to let go of the idea that her mother thinks she's a monster. That's easier said than done. Yes, it hurt her, and it still does. Yes, it affected her life and her self-perception deeply, and honestly, Yes, at certain points, it held some validity. Azula did monstrous things without a care in the world. But is it true? Is she a monster? No, she's human. And it would be worth her while to detach her identity from what she thought her mother thought of her. As it's clear, Azula still believes that her mother's imagined hurtful words were true, that she is a monster. Azula can't keep living off a lie. If she were really a monster, would the idea of those words hurt as much as it did? Another thing on letting go. As Azula attempts redemption and tries to live in a different way, she's going to face a lot of anger. Anger over how things turned out, over missed opportunities and missed chances. She's going to face a lot of grief, loss, resentment, and bitterness. This will only increase as she gains further clarity on what her father actually did to her and her life, and what she did based off of those things. It's funny because we already see Azula as an angry enough kind of character, but that is the tip of the iceberg on how angry she's going to be once she realizes the truth. At this point, her entire youth and formidable years have been squandered by pursuing her father's imperialistic desires and trying to shape herself into the best daughter for him. He's in prison, she's in prison, the throne is lost, the colonies are free, and the person she had been competing against is king now a person she believed was inherently weak and flawed only for him to prove to her that it was her all along and the man she idolized that had been weak and flawed. Azula is in the dirt, looking at a lifetime of pure effort with nothing to show for it. As we saw in the show, Azula had few friends. She didn't date, she didn't relax or do regular teenager things. She trained and fought and strategized and executed. She lost out on a lot of the things that occur during youth. Close relationships, learning of her own unique interests, the list goes on. She can still have those things, but not through the lens of childhood, because that's gone, and not without immense effort on her part to unlearn a lot of which she spent a childhood learning, attaching her identity and her self-worth to things she deemed important at the time, not things that may have actually been important to her. What am I holding? A cherry pit, princess. Correct. And what day is this? It is the day of your coronation. Yes, it is. So please, tell me why, on the most important day of my life, you've decided to leave a pit in my cherry? It wasn't a decision. It was just a small mistake. Small? Do you realize what could have happened if I hadn't sensed the pit in time? 
I suppose you could have choked? Yes. Then you understand the severity of your crime. Number five. Azula needs to learn that she can be safe even when she is not controlling everything. That things won't fall apart the minute she loosens her grip on the reins. Azula feels threatened at all times, and though she handled pressure with immense ease throughout the seasons, we all see how that lifestyle caught up with her in the end. Azula never decompresses, Azula never relaxes, because Azula feels that the minute she is not in control is the same minute that she will lose her father's affection, her peers' respect, and her general safety. She doesn't need supreme control over others or her own human impulses to be safe in the world. But she doesn't know that yet. <laughs> Number six. Azula needs to learn how to let love in and why to let love in. She sees love as a weakness, but it was her lack of it that shaped her and ultimately ruined her. Ignore! So, Sokka's your name, right? My favorite prisoner used to mention you all the time. She was convinced you were going to come rescue her. Of course, you never came, and she gave up on you. Number seven. Azula needs to learn healthy boundaries. She certainly has them with other people in her circle for herself. What she does not have is healthy boundaries between herself and her father. And she does not care or know to respect other people's boundaries while simultaneously expecting them to respect hers, something she likely learned from Ozai. Until she can learn and understand boundaries, she won't be able to break the hold that her father has on her, the codependency she feels towards him, and she won't be able to foster the healthy relationships she needs to thrive and grow from. Nobody wants to be around a constant boundary violator. Not respecting another person's boundaries is another control issue from Azula that needs reckoning with. She has said extremely cruel and insensitive things to people in the show and done extremely cruel and insensitive things to people in the show in order to display her daringness, her brutality. She has done several out-of-pocket things. Azula thinks it's her right, but it's just a lesson of Ozai that needs to be unlearned. Ozai also taught her to never have any boundaries with him or his expectations of her, which has left us with an Azula that we do not truly know. She does not even know who she is without him in her life, as she's been forced and allowed him as well to encroach on her life all these years. As a child, she doesn't know better. As an adult, it's her responsibility to learn herself her needs, her boundaries, and respect the boundaries of others. If she can't do that, she needs to figure out why. Azula always lies. Azula always lies. Azula always lies. Number eight. Azula needs to connect with her emotions. Not just the ones that Ozai likes or the ones befitting of a warrior princess, the ugly emotions too. The ones she would consider pathetic or simpering. All of those emotions are there for a reason, but Azula will never know if she never detaches herself from her toxic relationships and her forged identity. She is not only unaware of who she is, but why she is. Azula probably doesn't even fully understand why she lost it after the Agni Kai. All she knows is that she lost the battle and is alone after all the effort and heartbreak, and that Zuko isn't, despite being everything that she was taught not to be. She doesn't know anything past that because she's never fully connected with her emotions. She's never analyzed the importance of them or the signals they were telling her about the people in her life, about herself and her actions. She still feels, yes, but she quickly smothers those feelings to pursue the next task. This went on for years until it could go on no longer. Up to the Agni Kai, the emotion we've seen Azula feel the most strongly is rage and anger, but anger is often considered a secondary emotion. Anger tends to hide pain, sadness, and grief. All the suppression and anger did not assist her in the end, like it didn't assist Zuko until he faced himself and his emotions. He thought he'd have the world when he was a prince again, with his father's favor but he felt unease, which he could have smothered and went on with his life as the Fire Nation Prince, but after years with Iroh and personal growth, 
Zuko found his emotions impossible to ignore. He felt lack, emptiness, and inauthenticity. Instead of ignoring those things, only to have them bubble up years later, he did something about them. Azula never got that chance. This leads into the next thing. There has been a change of plans, Azula. What? I've decided to lead the fleet of airships to Ba Sing Se alone. You will remain here in the Fire Nation. But I thought we were going to do this together. My decision is final. Number nine. Azula needs to acknowledge how Ozai made her feel. Ozai was condescending, domineering, and cold. I don't think Ozai gave Azula kisses or hugs or even shoulder pats. I think he gave his daughter compliments and praise sparingly. She fought desperately for his affection, yes, but that in of itself had to have made her feel horrible. Who wants such a conditional love? A love that will only happen if you check all the right boxes in the right order and fit yourself into those boxes that may not even reflect your true shape, your true personality and desires. Ozai didn't love his daughter. He loved an expectation, an ideal, not Azula. And in a way, I think we all know that she knew that. If she wants to redeem herself and grow past her father and his expectations, she will have to face that demon. And that's not the only one. Even you fear me. No, I love you, Azula. I do. Number 10. Azula needs to acknowledge how her mother made her feel. Ursa never called her a monster outright. Ursa likely loved Azula in the same way she loved Zuko, despite Azula's behavior disturbing her at times and reminding her of Ozai, who she did not like. But it was how Ursa treated Azula that unknowingly built this narrative, this monster of a misunderstanding. Ursa did call out Azula's faults when Azula was around. She did not appear with Azula as intimately on screen as she did with Zuko. We see Ursa hug Zuko, talk with Zuko, play with Zuko. We don't see so much of this for Azula. They are Zuko's flashbacks, so his view will be biased. But from them, we can garner that he was a mother's boy while Azula was a daddy's girl. It is likely she became more of a daddy's girl because she felt her mother's love was closed off to her. She probably felt like she had no other option. Azula doesn't like Ursa because she once loved Ursa and felt as though Ursa rejected that love. Ursa was Azula's first love, as are most children with their mothers. Azula's first love made her feel ostracized, unvalued, and monstrous. Azula questioned her identity, wondering if she was really a bad person, a bad daughter. The answer scared her, because if the answer was yes, that meant she wouldn't have love ever, because who would love a monster, right? And so to avoid answering that question, she obsessed herself with becoming Ozai's golden child. Azula's first love being such a catastrophic result serves as a block from Azula loving others. She's afraid. And to overcome this fear, she will need to be very honest about how her mother made her feel and realize that even after all these years, Azula still does not have any answers for Ursa or herself. And that's okay. To what do we owe this honor? Hmm, must be a family trait. Both of you so quick to get to the point. I just gave you great news. I'm sure your brother simply needs a moment. Don't interrupt, uncle! Number 11. Azula needs to acknowledge how Zuko and Iroh made her feel. Zuko leaving made Azula feel as if she had a better chance at looking good in her father's eyes. Thus her sadistic smile at her brother's disfigurement and banishment. She sees Zuko as a threat to her father's conditional love, which is why she seeks to outperform and humiliate him constantly. It's a recurring, look at me, I'm better than him phenomenon, because she's insecure in Ozai's love for her. She knows in a sense that it is conditional, and that if she wants it, she'd better meet those conditions. Iroh left the nation to assist Zuko, not Azula. Iroh didn't love Zuko conditionally. Even though Iroh had conditions, he wanted Zuko to grow, he wanted Zuko to be better, he wanted Zuko to extend his self-view outside of his father and the royal family. Even when Zuko met none of those conditions, none of those ideals that Iroh had for him, Iroh still loved him. 
Iroh knew that their familial situation was a mess and yet chose to aid Zuko before Azula. The audience can understand it, seeing as how Zuko was less enmeshed with his father as he was cut off from both Ozai and the nation through banishment, but Azula may see it differently. Iroh helping Zuko and not her may read as abandonment. No Iroh, no Zuko, no Ursa, only Azula and her father's never-ending demands and desires. Despite wanting his conditional love, Azula was still a child. She must have felt abandoned, in a sense, by the only calm family member around. Why Zuko over me, she may have thought, reminding her of her mother and how she felt that her mother chose Zuko over her. Ozai seemed to be the only one to choose Azula, conditionally. She thought that was good enough. It wasn't. She'll have to face up to this too. I can't believe a year ago my purpose in life was hunting you down. And now... And now we're friends. Yeah. We are friends. Number 12. Azula needs to take an objective look at all her relationships. For years, she's viewed them through different agendas and facets of her identity. As a royal, as a princess, as an elite bender, as a Fire Nation citizen, as a prodigy, as a youth. She needs to take a good long look at all of her relationships outside of those things. She can still consider them, as they all play a big role in her relationships and how they played out, but she has to stop looking through them. She needs a clear viewfinder. That may make it easier for her to go from dutiful royal descendant fulfilling the wishes of the king and patriarch to daughter giving her father everything he wanted for love and ending up with nothing. The leap won't be that big right away, and it will be at Azula's pace, but it is necessary. She defines herself off of all of those qualities that are signifiers of her value, but what about her inherent value? Which leads into the next point. During the meeting, I was the perfect prince. The son my father wanted. But I wasn't me. Number 13. Azula needs to learn to love Azula alone. Not Princess Azula, not Prodigal Azula, not Elite Warrior Azula, not Strategist Azula. Azula alone. Azula thinks she needs all of these things to be enough. She already is enough. Enough said. <laughs> Number 14. Azula needs to learn that she deserves love and that she deserves the space to be emotional and upset. This will likely be one of the hardest tasks for her to accomplish. A lot of Azula's emotional resentment and frustration is with her parents. She is from a filial society where elders are revered, more so in higher class families and the utmost in a royal line. Any hostility from her, even if she truly felt it, could be read as a threat, a disgrace, an ungrateful child, a waste of a child. Azula doesn't want that. Azula wants to matter. She wants to have value. Showing her true emotions puts her in danger of losing that with the people that matter most to her, or so she thinks. And then, deserving love. Do you think that Azula thinks she deserves love? Monsters don't deserve love. But Azula has to learn that she isn't one. And that will be difficult after a lifetime of running from those connotations and after a lifetime of living by it to avoid how it makes her feel. Um, and what exactly do you think this will accomplish? Why does Azula need all these things for redemption? Here's why. Azula herself would not agree with the majority of this upcoming list for obvious reasons, but this doesn't make them any less true. Azula doesn't feel safe. Azula doesn't feel loved unconditionally and doesn't know how to do so. Azula doesn't feel in control. Azula doesn't feel valuable inherently. What she does is valuable, not her. Azula is insecure. Azula does not love herself. Azula does not know healthy boundaries. Azula does not know how to stop working off the past and work in the present. Azula doesn't know how to connect with her own emotions and sensitivities because right now she is numb. Azula needs to acknowledge what she needed as a kid and that she didn't get it and what it did to her, and still does to her. Azula needs to stop being classist and supremacist and materialistic. She is enough without those things. 
Azula needs spiritual work. Deep spiritual work. Deep, deep, deep. If Azula is going to get better, healthier, and grow as a person, she needs to do all of these things in some aspect. Doing some things will inherently help her do others, like learning to trust and learning to love go hand in hand. Fulfilling these redemption obligations will not make her everyone's ideal version of a good person. They may not even make her good. The end of her redemption may feel unsatisfying or null to some. She'll never be perfect. But perfect was never the goal. Healing is. And Azula's redemption will look a lot less like a villain turned hero and a lot more like a victim turned survivor. She may not help save the world like Zuko, but if she can save herself, that is enough. And that might put her halfway to saving the world from the person she would have been had she not healed. Damaged or healed, she's a force to be reckoned with, and she owes it to herself and others to better herself, knowing all the damage she can do, and also knowing that she deserves to get better. She will grow, she'll change, and that's all she really needs, and all it will really take in the end. She needs to be brave enough to kill herself, not literally, metaphorically. A different kind of end, a rebirth. Doing all of this will kill the Azula we know. Her huge ego will undergo a death and minimizing like no other. During the process of eliminating all that doesn't serve her or her life anymore, she will be left with nothing or feel like she's been left with nothing. She'll have none of her old tools at her disposal, none of her old motivations, and she will have to rebuild her identity and her worldview from absolute scratch without the help of a solid team to depend on. For someone as power hungry and controlling as her, this would be ultimately terrifying in every way. Her worst nightmare. No control, no power, no identity, no survival tools, no one, nothing. She will be like an infant, an angry, betrayed infant with baggage and a flamethrower. She will slip up constantly, make mistakes, and want to quit because growth in what she needs to be better, love and self-acceptance, is not familiar to her. And because she does not know these things, it will be hard for her to see the value in them that is worth the immense pain of self-transformation. She has spent a lifetime on doing external things for the validation, respect, and fear of others. Zuko was torn from that path the day he was forced to bear his scar. He was corralled into a different life, and it's why he keeps his scar, as it sets him apart. But Azula will have to choose it, as Zuko ultimately did in the end. Despite being forced, despite being burned and disfigured, despite abandonment and all the horrible things his father did to him, Zuko still sought that acceptance in the same way Azula did. They weren't so different, but Zuko ended up being different in the end because he chose something different. She has to want to change, not just for others, but for herself. You may think she is completely selfish and self-serving, but it is a guise. She's afraid, and she doesn't like herself, because if she did, she wouldn't spend every waking moment and breath trying to gain validation from and appease a man that clearly does not care about her, even if he is family, even if he is king. And if that heads home, good. Azula must learn to love Azula. You must learn to love you. She's scared to be unloved, unworthy, and alone, but she does not realize she can give herself all those things from her own heart or other hearts in the world if she learns to be brave enough to open up and to change. Ozai is not the only possibility in the world for love. Ursa isn't either, as hard as that may be for Azula to hear. There are other people who would be willing, if not happy, to care about her, so long as she was receptive, and at least tried to reciprocate those efforts. Who could these people be, you ask? Here's a few characters who could help Azula with some of the lessons she'll need to learn, if she doesn't learn them on her own. Some of these characters and lessons are interchangeable. You might even come up with a better option, and if you do, please share the idea down below in the comments. So who are the characters that can help her? Ready the torpedo. My first girlfriend turned into the moon. That's rough, buddy. Sokka can teach Azula how to let go. After dealing with the loss of Yue, his mother, his dad for a period of time to war, and feeling inadequate in a group of powerful people, 
Sokka knows what it's like to have stuff hang over you. Sokka had a lot of reasons to be resentful, and I'm sure he's allowed himself that at times. It's only healthy to do so. But at a certain point, Sokka faced forward and let go of those painful things. He didn't forget. He didn't always forgive, but he accepted it and he let it go. His easygoing personality can help show her the benefits of not having such a tight grip on everything, on being adaptable. I'm not looking for anyone's approval. I know who I am. Toph can teach Azula safety and self-value. Toph knows how she alone is enough and valid as a person. She doesn't try to prove anything to anyone, ever. She left a life of money, wealth, and prestige because she knew those things alone were not the entire composition of her as a human being. She knew leaving them would not take away from her as a person because rich or not, blind or seeing, young or old, Toph knows that she is the most valuable thing in her life. Toph can teach Azula how to have healthier boundaries. Toph doesn't block the world out, but she also doesn't let anything fly with her either. Azula may have an easier time respecting Toph's disposition, and she can learn a lot about how a young blind girl still helped to lead a revolution, and how she still finds worth in a society that may have otherwise considered her worthless. You have indeed felt a great loss, but love is a form of energy, and it swirls all around us. The air nomads love for you has not left this world. It is still inside of your heart and is reborn in the form of new love. Aang can teach Azula how to let love in. Aang has a lot of love for his friends, associates, and the world in general. He respects others and himself to a point. He's not afraid to show intimacy or be vulnerable. And the times he was afraid, he learned to work through them. He is the most powerful being in the world especially in her eyes, because he was able to dethrone her father and take his bending away. And yet, the most powerful being does not need fear or hardness or cruelty to stay in control and stay powerful. She could learn a lot from Aang. Together, him and Azula could have some pretty intense heart chakra sessions. But now you're not letting yourself feel anything. I know sometimes it hurts more to hope and it hurts more to care but you have to promise me that you won't stop caring. Come on, you need a hug. Katara can teach Azula how to connect with her emotions. Katara is an inherently emotional being, and though it's something fans often joke about, this quality of hers could be helpful for Azula. Katara is somewhat intuitive and may be able to point out something that hurts or bothers Azula that she herself cannot understand or face. Katara can also show Azula how emotions can be just as powerful as the lack thereof in their own soft, indirect way. The power to build relationships is just as valuable as the power to level cities and empires. Is it your own destiny or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? Iroh can teach Azula how Ozai made her and everyone else around him feel, and the truth of his character unclouded by the view of a child observing a parent. Azula has only ever been surrounded by people who worship and admire her father, if not outright fear him. She doesn't understand a neutral objective view of the kind of person that he is. He has statues and tributes all over the Fire Nation and their colonies. Who's really bad-mouthing him when he runs everything, from government to society? Iroh isn't an Ozai sympathizer. He can teach Azula the truth of her situation and the truth of her childhood. He was never one to mince words. I honestly don't think Iroh cares for Azula in the way that he does for Zuko, or that if he does care about her, he suppresses it, knowing what a danger she is, or assuming her to be a lost cause. And so the voids Iroh cannot fill, someone else could step in. I'm sorry it has to end this way, brother. No, you're not. Zuko. Zuko can teach Azula how to love Azula. He's been doing it all this time, hasn't he? He would know better than anyone. He clearly sees value in her still, after all this time, after everyone else gave up on her, including Azula herself. 
Maybe following his example could make things a little easier for Azula. Humans are social creatures. They go off of examples. It's easier to love yourself when you know those around you love you too. It's harder to love yourself when those around you do not show you any love in your life. And so maybe Zuko can be the first reintroduction for Azula and help her help herself. And so that is the end of Azula on the couch. That is the end of Azula's needs for redemption, why she is the way she is. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or questions, feel free to leave them below. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more. And then I'll leave you with this question. What do you think Azula needs for redemption?